In this chapter, Assessment and Care of the Newborn, we are going to be discussing what we do pretty much initially, immediately when the baby is delivered, all the way through preparation for discharge. Well, what does an APGAR score tell us about our baby? Remember, until delivery in the first breath, all we have to go on to, to determine the status of the fetus in utero was the um, external fetal monitoring. But what we see on the strip isn't always a true depiction of what's going on inside. So we do an assessment and assign a score to our baby that's based on five criteria activity or tone, pulse or the heart rate, grimacing or a reflex, appearance or color, and our respirations. Each category can receive a score of 0, 1, or 2, and if the neonate scores perfect in each category, then your APGAR score is a 10. Now, personally, I've never seen a neonate get a 10 at one minute, or really even at five minutes. However, I have heard other nurses report this happening. You have to remember babies are rarely ever completely pink um, in that first few minutes. Um, so getting a two on color is going to be pretty hard. Now they can receive a two in all other categories, um, which means that they would get maybe a one for color and two for everything else, so their APGAR would be a nine. As long as the neonate scores at least a 7, he is considered in good condition. Every neonate is going to be assessed at 1 minute and 5 minute, regardless of the score of the first APGAR. Why? If we get a 7 at 1 minute, why do we have to look at it again? Well, go back to the initial you know, thread in the question. The um, external and electric fetal monitoring, it will not always give us an accurate reflection of the fetal status um, once it's out because it may look good, but it really isn't. That first one minute APGAR is going to give me an indication. It reflects fetal status in utero. Then, because we know babies are respiratory driven, we have to determine how that baby transitions from being inside mom to being outside of mom. Did the baby figure out what needs to happen and how to breathe? Remember, they're respiratory driven. If they're not breathing, nothing else working. So that five minute score will reflect transition. Did your fetus figure out how to transition from intrauterine life to extrauterine? If both the one minute and the five minute APGAR are at least seven, then you're done, okay? However, a score of less than seven at five minutes indicates there's some degree of depression and difficulty with the transition, so you're gonna do an APGAR assessment at five minute intervals thereafter until you reach a score of seven. So if we say 10 is perfect, parents sometimes freak out whenever they say, well, my baby's only a 7. It is important that we educate parents to know that any APGAR score between 7 and 10 is good, okay? If you see a 4 to 6 that's moderately depressed, they are probably having respiratory issues. 0 to 3, this baby's probably going to be in the NICU. Well, what interventions can you expect to do in the initial hours of life? When you consider that the neonate is respiratory driven, airway maintenance is going to be critical. Use of the bulb syringe is standard and should always be immediately accessible for use, which means it's going to be there at delivery. It's going to be in the um, crib with the baby. Parents need to be told how to use it. you got to have your bulb syringe. When you're with your baby, if you see secretions, then you suction them out. You want to be careful you don't stick the tip of the bulb syringe deep into the throat or up against any soft structures. You want to nest it into, you know, the pocket of the cheek there. Um, because, as we've already discussed, babies are obligatory nose breathers, you want to make sure you clear the mouth first and then you go to the nose. Because if you go to the nose first, you can have a nasal stimulation, cause the baby to gasp, and the baby may aspirate anything that's in the mouth and throat. 
um, NRP, which is the neonatal resuscitation, they don't recommend doing um, deep suctioning on a neonate if you see vigorous activity. The idea being that you want that baby to move the secretions on their own. But if the baby is not vigorous, if it's limp, flaccid, at that time you're going to go in and you're going to do your deep suction. If you have meconium in the amniotic fluid and the baby aspirates, if the baby can get it up themselves, you try, let them try and give it up themselves. If not, there's actually a little um, device called a meconium aspirator. It's really just like a little suction trap that you will be able to um, get the meconium aspirate out. Once the baby's airway is patent, then she should start breathing on her own and everything else is going to follow suit. So that, like her heart rate is going to pick up and it's going to maintain uh, above 100 so that she's going to have adequate perfusion um, for oxygenation, thermoregulation. If the baby doesn't go skin to skin right away, then it'll go under a radiant warmer because we need that temp to get up to at least 36 degrees centigrade. The baby's first bath is deferred until the temperature has been stabilized and that can be four or more hours. If the baby's in a warmer, a continuous temp monitor device will be placed on the upper quadrant of the abdomen, making sure it doesn't go over a bony area. Preventative measures that we do for the baby include what we refer to as eyes and thighs, which is the administration of the eye ointment. Typically, it's erythromycin, ophthalmic um, ointment, and your vitamin K given in the thigh. Um, the erythromycin is regulated care. However, even though the vitamin K injection is the preferred route because of the um, timing of onset of action, parents can refuse um, the vitamin K injection in preference of oral, but it's going to take more doses. Efficacy is not the same, so we really do want to do the vitamin K injections. If you look on page 485 um, in your text, you'll see the dosage and administration for these medications. The um, umbilical cord stump will be treated with triple dye once. So if you see a, an umbilical cord that's purple, it's had triple dye on it. After that, subsequent management will simply be cleaning with you know, water. Keep it dry. You don't use alcohol, soap, or anything else. You're going to observe for signs and symptoms of infection, such as redness, drainage, edema, anything that could alert you to infection every time you change the diaper. Okay. The typical time for um, the stump to separate from what will become the belly button is about 10 to 14 days. And you need to keep parents involved with the care of their newborn from the very first minute. Um, by doing this, you're going to go far in promoting the bonding that results from timely and repeated parent interactions. A cursory or abbreviated physical assessment is completed pretty quickly after delivery with the full assessment of the baby being done within the ensuing 24 hours. It's important to make sure the newborn is transitioning well and is not experiencing any distress when the assessment is being performed. So you don't want to do it too early and the baby can't get its temperature maintained because you don't want to take it out of its um, thermoneutral environment. Not all babies are delivered with the providers knowing a definite gestational age, meaning Kind of like my niece who didn't get any prenatal care. She didn't tell anybody she was pregnant. She didn't know how pregnant she was when she went to have the baby. So if they you know, didn't know what it was or how pregnant she was, you have to figure out by assessment where the baby may be. So you start with what you know, what you see, you figure it out, and you go from there. If you have an idea of what the gestational age should be, then you can classify the newborn uh, based on weight. So if you know, okay, I'm looking at 36-weeker, 38-weeker, whatever, um, and their size, their weight is appropriate, they are AGA, or appropriate for gestational age. If the weight is above the 90th percentile, say you do know that she is 35 weeks, 
Um, but she was born to a diabetic mom, so at 35 weeks, baby actually, I don't know, weighs 9 pounds. Okay, that's going to be large for gestational age. If it's below the 10th percentile, it's going to be small for gestational age. So by deductive reasoning, you can figure out that if the baby is between the 10th and the 90th percentile, they're appropriate birth weight. If you are working with a pretty reliable due date, you can classify the newborn according to the gestational weeks of their age. A fetus that is delivered before a completed 37 weeks, so anything up to 36 weeks and 6 days, is considered preterm. Now, if he makes it to 34 weeks, and delivers between 34 and 0 and 36 and 6, he's going to be considered late preterm. It's still preterm, but it's later, okay? It comes up close. This is potentially a bad position for the neonate to be in because he may look like a full-term baby, okay? It may be a bigger baby, all the parts are put together, if you just look at it, you say, oh, yeah, that, baby's, that baby cooked long enough. But the systems haven't yet fully matured, so that baby is more susceptible to stress. Now, your term, as defined by your textbook, is any delivery that happens between 38 and 42 weeks. Okay, so that, that's a range. Once your fetus hits 41 weeks, the real world... Um, we'll refer to this baby as post-dates. They will do non-stress tests for fetal well-being. Your textbook classifies post-term or post-dates as a pregnancy that goes beyond a completed 42 weeks of gestation. If the pregnancy goes beyond 42 weeks and there is identified issues with the fetus, Maybe recurrent late D cells, variabilities minimal to absent, um, low pH on cord gas, anything um, like that, then we recognize this as effects of placental insufficiency, and we will tag the newborn as a post-mature newborn because the placenta is past its maturity level. It had simply aged too much to be effective um, as the site of gas exchange for the fetus while it was in utero. Now, if you have no idea how far along the pregnancy was, you can estimate your gestational age of your neonate based on your neonatal assessment and what do you see. For many years, Dubowitz was the standard for determining gestational age based on physical findings, but there was a um, simplified assessment scale that Ballard created that looked at six physical and six neurological um, scales to assign an age. The Ballard was effective in assessing your 35 to 42 weaker gestation, okay? But what about those that were born younger? Because we know that viability starts at 20 weeks. If I deliver a 24 or 25 week fetus, then there's the potential for viability, but how do I determine how young or old that is? Well, the new Ballard scale has come into practice um, because it gives us the ability to determine gestational age as early as 20 weeks by assessing things specific to extremely preterm infants, such as fused eyelids, um, imperceptible breast tissue, and a square window angle that is greater than 90 degrees. And those are just a few of the things that it can look at. To ensure accuracy of age determination, it is recommended to Dubowitz or Ballard the neonate within the first 48 hours. If you do it past that 48 hours, then there will be growth and change, even in that small time frame, that is going to skew what your assessment findings are, and it may lead you to assign a gestational age that is not appropriate to the baby. As previously mentioned, the late preterm infant is one that can fall through the cracks as far as care goes for the simple reason that he looks like a full-term infant, so we want to treat him like a full-term infant. 
However, he is still premature, okay, and he will carry the same prematurity risks as a 36-weeker um, that weighs 6 pounds um, as the 32-weeker that may weigh 3 pounds, okay? It's the physiologic immaturity, not just how big he looks, but just the physiology. He's still prone to respiratory distress, um, temperature instabilities, not wanting to feed well. The systems have not been given the extra time to mature like the full-term infant has, okay? So just because he looks older, looks fully developed, looks like he's term, doesn't mean he is. All right, well being delivered can cause some ugly injuries in our newborn. Uh, we talked last week about the caput that can result from the use of a vacuum, but there are other things that can happen we need to know about. If forceps are used, um, and they don't use forceps very often anymore, but if they do, there's the risk of soft tissue injury to the baby's face from the pressure of the the prongs, the forceps themselves, um, as well as nerve injury because of where they grip the head. If pressures on the head are too high during childbirth, um, being squeezed too much or anything, then the baby could have subconjunctival or retinal hemorrhages. So their eyes may, the whites of their eyes are going to be bloodshot red. It looks pretty bad to parents, but what you need to do is just reassure them the blood from capillaries that have popped just from the increased pressure, and they will resolve over the next few days um, into the weeks. If you've got a mom who's pushed for a very long time, or a baby that was in a face presentation, you can expect some facial edema and even bruising. When an emergent cesarean uh, delivery is being performed, sometimes it's better to cut quickly into the uterus so you can get the baby out and risk the fetus sustaining a laceration than being delicate, dissecting through tissues and taking more time when the fetus may not have the time to spare. We talked a little bit about jaundice, uh, so let's look at it just an inch deeper. When hemoglobin um, is released from the lysis and breaking down of red blood cells, it needs to be excreted. Okay, so hemoglobin breaking down from red blood cells. The hemoglobin is converted to bilirubin and is released in an unconjugated or what we call indirect form. Unconjugated the hemoglobin will bind to albumin and it will enter the liver to become conjugated. We call conjugated direct bilirubin and this will be excreted as bile. However, if it is unbound or unconjugated, there's the possibility the hemoglobin will enter the circulation and it will permeate into other tissues. Um, when we have this happen, we see jaundice. Now, physiologic jaundice will occur in about 80% of your um, preemies, your preterm babies. Physiologic jaundice is considered normal as a newborn transitional event, but it is monitored closely to make sure the bilirubin levels do not rise too high and stay up for too long. Physiological jaundice usually presents itself after the first 24 hours of life. Um, if you have it within the first 24 hours of life, that's when it's going to be an issue. And later on, um, in later chapters, we'll talk about the difference in that. So refer to Table 17.2 um, in your text um, for causes of um, indirect hyperbilirubinemia. If the jaundice is present in the first 24 hours of life, we do consider this pathologic, and it does carry more concerns and risks. If the bilirubin levels stay elevated and deposit in the brain, then neurological and cognitive delays may be seen. If it's in the brain, we will refer to this as cornicterus, and that's a pretty serious situation. Um, I think I told y'all last week, you know, Rachel had jaundice whenever she was a baby. Um, just she didn't need further hospitalization or anything. A lot of it was associated with the breastfeeding that I was doing. In the breastfed newborn, the decrease in the fluid, hydration, 
caloric intake that the breastfed baby has initially results in a reduced hepatic clearance of the conjugated or direct bilirubin. Remember, the neonate has been cut off from the mom's glucose supply, so we always have to worry about hypoglycemia in our babies. We do like a newborn's um, glucose to be above 50 to begin with. That gives us a little wiggle room. Um, if it drops below 45 initially, then we are going to do some interventions about that. So look at this poor little guy and look at that face. Doesn't it just make your heart break? What you see is the newborn who had a rough delivery and experienced some pretty significant facial bruising and edema that was associated with them having a face presentation. All right, so, you know, assessment is more than necessarily just the physical aspect of it. What do you look at diagnostically? Blood glucose is needed to see how the newborn is doing because we know he's going to need energy for thermoregulation. And we know that he's cut off from his mom's supply. So you want to make sure that you monitor your blood glucoses. Your bilirubin levels are standard um, to assess for possible jaundice. Remember, jaundice occurs when the bile is above 5. Unconjugated um, is your indirect conjugated is your direct and a quote billy light which is a little tool that you can actually use to press on the skin is referred to as zapping the skin and that will determine the levels of jaundice um, in the baby and that's using a tool you don't have to have any kind of tool to assess it you can check for jaundice by simply pressing against the skin um, against a bony surface such as the forehead. So you take your finger, press on the forehead, you hold it for quite a few seconds because what you're wanting to do is to um, empty all blood out of the capillaries. So you want to take any natural pinkness from the blood away. If the area appears yellow before the blood comes back into the capillaries, then the baby is jaundiced. Um, Switching over per federal regulations, all newborns are screened for PKU, which is a potentially devastating detrimental neurologic disorder. Okay? Um, sickle cell disease will be screened for in race-appropriate patients, and then there will be screening for galactosemia. If there's a concern about a mother's drug status, uh, the baby may have drug screen performed. It may be a urine screen, but even more specific and to give you um, a broader database, you can do a meconium um, drug screen as well. Um, if you're collecting a venous sample on your baby and you're doing it through a heel stick, you need to make really sure that you go to the lateral heel um, instead of doing it in the middle because you don't want to inadvertently stick um, the foot and hit a nerve. Um, we've got a picture illustration of that uh, next, but you can look at page 499 in your textbook and you can see the illustration there. Um, on page 498, you're going to see table 17.3. That's going to outline your newborn screening test like we talked about here. So go ahead and review your textbook as well as what we've talked about here. Um, depending on what the test is or what intervention is being done, um, there's different reasons for it, but a neonatal restraint may be required. Um, now. We all think of restraints as putting a wrist restraint on and you know, tying somebody down, but for neonates, it's going to be a little bit different. So we are going to review restraint techniques on the next few slides. All right, before we get into restraints, because I told you I'd have it in here, this is um, the venipuncture slide. So if you look um, over to the left, you can see um, the venipuncture, the areas at the heel and where the nerves are. So the shaded area to the lateral aspect of the heel is where you would want to do a stick so that you can stay pretty far away from where any nerves are. 
if you are collecting a specimen um, from a vein, such as what's happening here, um, getting this out of the baby's wrist, a butterfly is going to be a really good tool to use because they're more easy to handle and manage. Um, and it stands to reason the neonate's veins are going to be really, really small. So you're going to need a larger gauge needle. And by that, you know, I mean talking a 25 gauge, not the 18 gauge that you would use on adults. Here you see um, a swaddle restraint, or sometimes it's referred to as a mummy restraint. Um, I say they're wrapped up like little burritos, <laughs> because you got to think about they were tucked nice snug um, inside in the utero, and so that's a comfort to them. Um, it's holding them in, minimizing any um, stimulus. So the baby is secured in a wrap, it feels a bit more comfortable, and it can't flail around when you're trying to get a specimen collection. So you put the baby down on um, the blanket, as you see in picture A, and you can do it one of two ways. You can tuck both arms in, or you can leave one arm out. Because remember, babies will sometimes suck on their fist for consolability, so you can go either way. But you take one corner and you're going to wrap it over the baby and a lot of times you'll, um, if you're getting both arms, you're going to get that arm kind of tucked down so that it comes up a little bit over the shoulder, goes across the body diagonally, tucks underneath the baby. Then you're going to pick the bottom of it up and you're going to pull it up towards the baby's head and you're going to tuck the tail of that into the top edge for where you folded it over the first time and then the um, last wrap you're going to tuck the arm down if you're going to put both arms in or leave one arm out and you're just going to wrap the blanket um, crossways on the other side of the baby and tuck it under behind them and they get wrapped up like a little burrito. Other procedures that sometimes are done are something as simple as um, a lumbar puncture if you're worried about um, anything, you know, sepsis, neurological, or whatever with your baby, or you may need to get femoral access, uh, either to do an uh, inguinal femoral assessment or to put a line or anything like that. You don't necessarily have to have a physical restraint device um, to do those kinds of things. You can simply, um, with the diaper to protect the genitalia, you can hold the, um, the legs open. You've got one hand um, on the lower abdomen across the um, bottom genital area and then one um, other hand stabilizing the leg so that you can keep it um, abducted opening up that um, inguinal region. If you're doing a spinal tap, a lumbar puncture, then you can just simply hold the baby with one hand. You can curl it up and one hand is holding the extremities in the front and you're supporting baby with the other hand. Now, I talked earlier about there are sometimes when you want to get a urine sample um, on your baby, especially if you're doing, say, a urine drug screen. So this is just showing you different um, methods for collecting urine samples, especially, um, well, with little boys and little girls, actually. It can go either way. With the boys, it's easier because the penis can actually stick down into the collection bag. But with the little girls, you got to make sure that you seal everything off well because whenever she voids, you don't want the urine to run down, you know, between the labial folds and then um, down the um, buttocks crack. So you got to make sure that the adhesive sticks all the way around the perimeter well enough that the urine is going to flow into the bag and it's not going to flow underneath the babies. The infant safety um, is a majorly significant crucial aspect of newborn care um, in the hospital and once they go home. Okay, You want to make sure in the hospital the environment is um, safe for the newborn. You want to instruct the mother to keep the crib away from the door. Um, Any time that you go in the room you want to check the mom's armband against the baby's um, anytime you take the baby into the room, um, anytime you take the baby out of the room, anytime you're going in to do an assessment or an intervention, you want to make sure you got the right baby and the right mom. Um, 
when they are labeling the baby, banding the baby when it's born, the baby will get an ID band and then you will have a matching ID band with matching numbers placed on the mom. So you'll check mom's ID to make sure she is who she says she is, but you're also going to be checking that matching ID band on mom that correlates to the baby. You always want to make sure you got the right baby and the right mom. Um, you want to make sure if you have an infant security bracelet, um, so something that is going to trigger an alarm, shut down the um, locks on the doors, you need to make sure that the security bracelet is um, firmly in contact with the baby's skin because it's being in contact that it's able to track wherever the baby goes. If that um, security tag is removed or broken from the newborn skin contact, it's not going to be able to set off the alarms. We do know that bonding occurs in the first 30 to 60 minutes. Remember we talked about that last week. Um, you know, we had that first period of reactivity with the baby and moms and dads are looking into the baby's eyes and such. So that bonding is going to initiate then. If you place the baby skin to skin, then you're going to promote the bonding because moms and babies are in face with each other right up close. Um, it's also going to enhance the initiation and continuation of breastfeeding. Moms need to be able to recognize their baby's cues and uh, of when they're hungry, when they need something. Um, and so they're going to put the baby to breast as often as possible to uh, maximize the supply and demand effect because that's what breastfeeding is, it's supply and demand. So if I take it out, um, it's a demand that I need to put more in. So the more often that you can put the baby to breast, the better it's going to be. So you want to encourage that um, breastfeeding or at least going to the breast every two to three hours. At most, um, you, you want to support the on-demand feeding which is the importance of recognizing the cues. If you've got a mom who says she doesn't want to breastfeed, she can still go skin to skin. Sometimes babies will find the nipple and latch on anyway, and at least if moms will do it, they can um, have that initial colostrum that can go to baby, and then they can choose um, to formula feed thereafter. You can do skin to skin whether you're breastfeeding or not. It is still one of the most absolute um, beneficial things for moms and for babies. All right, so last week we talked about needing to give vitamin K because you have sterile gut, you don't have bacteria um, to um, synthesize vitamin K, so we have to give it, all right? To give vitamin K, you're going to need a 25 gauge, 5 8 cents needle. You're going to put it in the preferred site, which is the vastus lateralis. To do this, you're going to stabilize the leg, clean the area, stabilize the muscle uh, between your thumb and your forefinger, forefinger, and insert the needle at a 90 degree angle into the muscle. You're going to give um, 0.5 to 1 milligram, and vitamin K is administered within the first hour of life. Now, another um, intervention uh, is to treat jaundice. Jaundice is treated with phototherapy to reduce serum levels of the unconjugated bilirubin. Remember the hemoglobin, um, the lysis of the red blood cells, the hemoglobin has to bind to albumin, go to the liver, be conjugated and excreted. But if it doesn't bind, then it goes into the circulation as unconjugated uh, bilirubin. Phototherapy, which treats that, is when the infant is placed unclothed, um, meaning it will have maybe a little uh, covering for the genitals, but no other clothing sources on. So unclothed under a light source um, with specific distances and um, wattage and stuff depending on equipment and the policies of the facility. The light from um, the equipment should be measured during therapy to make sure that it is effective in the exposure and the treatment. It is mandatory to shield the eyes with a mask during phototherapy to prevent damage. 
and being under the lights can affect the baby's temperature and water loss uh, so you need to make sure your baby stays adequately hydrated we don't want them to get dehydrated from the light exposure you keep them hydrated with either milk or formula you do not give water okay so the hydration is done with either milk or formula you're going to monitor the baby's stools and the urine for color and amount and you're going to observe the skin for irritation and breakdown um, they will ha may have frequent and loose stools associated with the phototherapy and um, getting rid of the bilirubin and that's going to be irritating and you may see excoriations on the skin so every time you change the diaper you want to make sure you clean them well and that you're assessing them well other ways to do the phototherapy um, you may have a billy bed which is an LED light source that is under the baby and you put the baby kind of on a platform or a fiber optic blanket that can actually be placed around the neonate it's important to make sure you're telling your parents um, what to watch for and when especially in thinking about um, jaundice because it's not always going to be immediate your bilirubin levels will rise up until around day five um, and by then parents are probably going to be home because parents are going home within two to three days after having a baby right so if your bilirubin levels go up around day five it's your parents who are going to be the first ones to identify there may be a concern in the healthy term newborn with jaundice phototherapy may be done at home if the parents can and will take on the responsibilities of monitoring the temperature you know how much light exposure is it safe is my baby hydrated enough um, if the parents can't do that then you may have home care services come and do this um, circumcision is another thing to think about now circumcision is an elective procedure it does require informed consent and it should be a joint decision of the parents um, in the past when circumcisions were done on babies they didn't use anesthesia of any kind they just figured the babies didn't feel it or something um, that sounds cruel and now the American Academy of Pediatrics American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology together have released recommendations um, to use either a topical um, cream such as an Imla cream or a dorsal block a penile block to make sure the babies aren't experiencing any pain um, another soothing technique is to dip a pacifier in a sugar solution and that's going to promote the sucking and suckling in the neonate is a self-soothing measure as a nurse you're going to need to observe the circumcision site for bleeding every 30 minutes in that first hour and then every hour for the next four to six hours if you do see bleeding you're going to apply gentle pressure um, with sterile gauze to the site if bleeding doesn't stop um, then you can use other products uh, like gel foam a cellulose product to kind of um, clot off keep it from bleeding you will cleanse the penis gently with water you're going to apply fresh petroleum jelly around the glands each time you have a diaper change so previously I kind of talked through how to do an IM injection so here you can see kind of the nurses how she's got it positioned um, she has the leg secured and with her non-dominant hand she stabilizes the muscle of the leg between the forefinger and thumb and then with her dominant hand you see that she has um, inserted the needle at a 90 degree angle into that muscle Now remember I told you that the babies will go unclothed under the light when they're doing phototherapy well you have to do the mask on the eyes because you need to protect the eyes it's an important thing to make sure that the eyes are closed before you put the mask on because you don't want to have any damage to the cornea any scratches or anything and the mask should completely cover the eyes but you want to make sure that it doesn't cover up the nose or the nares because the baby still needs to breathe 
it goes under the war the light unclosed because you want to expose as much skin as possible so the light can break down the bilirubin. But you do want to protect the genitals so you can form, you know, devise something that, for lack of a better word, is like a string bikini. So it protects the genitals, but it still will leave a goodly amount of skin exposed to the light. So what you see here is um, a circumcision being performed with a yellen, or I refer to it as a gomco clamp. What happens is the provider will take that little center stick, the center post that you see there. It has a flange tip on the end of it. So they'll take that tip and they'll sit it down on the head of the penis. And then they will pull the um, foreskin up over that little flange. So you can kind of see in that center stick that you've got the foreskin it's sitting up and you've got the head of the penis protected up under that flange. Um, then he'll take the clamp that he will put the post into the top of it, slide it over the hole there, and once he has that bottom piece there set down and it'll rest on that flange so that all he has now is the head of the penis, the, um, I guess, body of the penis down below that little platform, and up above that he has the foreskin. He will then tighten the clamp down and then he'll take a knife blade and with a knife blade he will cut the foreskin free running it along the edge of where that platform is. Um, once the foreskin is taken away then he will remove um, all of the clamps. You will have then the head of the penis, the glands, and they will put a petroleum gauze. They will just wrap it around the penis and then they will um, observe that for the bleeding. We do need to assess babies for pain and be aware of what their responses are uh, because they can't tell us when or what hurts, okay? We want to minimize what they feel in a negative way and for how long they feel it, and we want to help them cope with what they're experiencing, kind of the same way you would do uh, an adult. You need to remember, a newborn um, in pain is going to cry, grimace, um, possibly flailing their hands and feet around, just setting up a little bit of a fuss. All of this takes energy, okay, and depending upon the age and the level of maturity, um, she may not have the metabolic reserves for oxygenation and in energy expenditure that a term baby has. So it's really important to keep them calm so that if they are a pre-termer, they don't utilize the resources limited that they have for a pain response. You can help soothe babies by doing what we call the five S's. You can swaddle them up because, remember, that little cocoon, it's a soothing thing. You can swing them, so holding them in your arms, just swinging them side to side. You can do the shushing sound, and a lot of times I do that with swinging, so it's shh, 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 okay? The sucking, so they can suck on a passy, they can suck on their fist, they can suck on your fingertip, okay? So you can just put a gloved finger in the baby. Remember Princess Diana? Um, pictures where she was holding her babies and her pinky was in the baby's mouth. She was soothing them by letting them suck. And then the last thing is to hold them on either a sideline or a stomach um, position because uh, the pressure that it exerts um, can also help calm them down. Um, Non-nutritive sucking so sucking on a pinky, a fist, a passy, anything like that is a self-soothing activity. Your babies can receive medications, um, but you do need to use care and caution when you're giving them medicines. Your morphine and your fentanyl are the most commonly used opioid medications. Your acetaminophen is used for your mild pain, and your ketorolac is used for any post-op pains. Um, we did talk about the topical agents like the IMLA and then the blocks when we were talking about the circumcision. So remember those are um, pain management for medications as well. 
All parents need to know the proper way to install a car seat and how they need to put the baby into the car seat. Remember, the car seat faces the rear window and should always be in the back seat of the vehicle. Um, you need to be careful about giving pacifiers to your babies. They're, even though you know, we said on the previous slide, well, pacifiers, um, you know, sucking, soothing, there is a current discussion over the negative impact that pacifiers have um, on breastfeeding. If the newborn needs to engage in non-nutritive sucking and that self-soothing, then, kind of like we said, consider letting her suck on the um, tip of your finger, you know, put the baby to breast, let the baby suck on its own fist. Pacifier sucking um, uses different muscles and is a different feel, and it can actually interfere with the baby learning how to do an effective latch for breastfeeding. Um, you need to review cord and skin care with your parents when the next visit is. Is it a visit for a weight check with lactation or are you going to the pediatrician's office? You need to make sure they're aware of what the follow-ups are. Um, discuss your vaccination schedules and the importance of following up with that. What shot is due when? Uh, really, all parents should be capable of CPR for the newborn. Um, whomever is going to be a caregiver for the baby should be capable of um, infant CPR. You want to review signs of distress or potential complications uh, such as what constitutes a fever, you know, how should the baby be breathing, what should wet and dirties look like and how many should they have. A typical rule of thumb is six to eight wets a day and at least three dirties a day. Um, you're going to know how your baby's hydrated by, you know, what fluid are they putting out and what does it look like. Your breastfed babies will feed more frequently than formula-fed babies because their digestion is very effective with breaking down breast milk, so it's going to clear the milk out um, in a shorter time frame, so they'll need to feed more often. Your breastfed baby is going to nurse about every two to three hours. Okay. You need to remember this is her food and her water. She goes through it pretty quickly. It is not recommended that breastfed babies go more than one four-hour period without nursing. So, you know, the mom who's so proud that her baby slept through the night, that's not a good thing, not to begin with, okay? So every two to three hours, breastfed babies will nurse. You don't want them going more than one four-hour period without anything. When you're putting a baby down, um, they should be placed on their back. The mantra is, quote-unquote, back to sleep. They should be in an unencumbered crib. That means there are no loose blankets, uh, there are no toys, there's no pillows, there's no bumper pads. There's nothing in the bed with the baby but the baby. If you're worried about the baby getting cold, put the baby in a um, footed onesie or in one of those baby gowns that's got the little cinch around the bottom so that you cover the feet up. You need to remind parents that babies are going to have you know, normal rashes. Remember the little milia on the face. Um, you, you need to make sure they understand what is expected and what could be a problem. When Rachel had chicken pox, now she wasn't going home as a new baby, um, but she was still in diapers, and I saw the a single little um, vesicle on her mons. I, whenever I changed her diaper, and I was like, huh, that's interesting, what's that? You know, being a nurse, I still had to stop and think about it. So you need to talk to your parents about what's normal and abnormal in the skin. When you're figuring out how you're going to dress the baby, think about how you dress yourself. If you're hot, if you would like to be in lighter clothes because you're stuffy, your baby may feel the same way. If you're cold and you need extra layers, then the baby's going to need that. So kind of treat the baby the way you would treat yourself. So here you see um, a car seat installed in the back seat. And this looks like a four-door vehicle. Okay, so rear-facing back seat. And if you notice, this car seat is placed in the middle of the back seat as well. So it looks like the front are bucket seats and the baby is in the middle 
um, facing the window. You need to be sure parents understand what to watch for in the first few days. Jaundice, wet sturdies, feeding schedules, amounts, why are they taking in, that kind of stuff. Depending on what type of birth the mom had um, will a lot of times determine what she can get back to doing. Um, if she had a cesarean birth, she's probably going to be um, limited in what her ADLs are going to be, but she may very well still want to get up, take a shower, brush her teeth, eat, sleep, that kind of stuff. Um, if the floor doesn't get swept or the dishwasher run, that's going to be okay. All right. You need to let her slowly get back into, remember she's transitioning into a new role, so let her take it at her own pace. Everybody wants to come and see the new baby. I mean, they're just so excited, friends, family, everybody, they want to come. But what you really need to do is to tell her to limit the visitors um, in the first few weeks even, okay? Let the parents get used to being parents. And you also have the benefit of keeping baby away from unnecessary exposures to things. Um, it was four weeks before I took Rachel home to visit anybody. Now, my mom and my mother-in-law came and stayed with me, so they did get to see Rachel. But as far as letting her see anybody else, I pretty much kept her to myself for about the first four weeks. You need to, you know, tell mom to pay attention to the baby's crying uh, because the cry is going to be the cue for, hey, this is what I need. Your babies will have sleep-wake cycles. However, babies can't differentiate morning from night. So there may be a process that you have to go through to kind of help get that coordinated for the babies and, um, for lack of a better word, maybe train them to sleep more during the night and less during the day as they get older and as they mature a little bit. Uh, kind of like, you know, your bed, so the baby's crib, that's your nighttime sleep, okay? So when you get ready to put the baby down for the night, put the baby down for the night in her crib. If it is not time to go down for the night, so if it's just daytime stuff or afternoon, evening stuff, then keep the baby out in, for lack of a better word, public in your house, okay? If she gets sleepy and she needs to take a nap, don't put her in her crib for that. Then, you know, just hold her, rock her, or put her, you know, um, in a bouncy or on a pallet or something like that. But you want her to start equating crib, nighttime routine, good night's sleep, as opposed to sleeping anytime and anywhere. And really, just to wrap this up, I mean, you're telling your parents what they need to pay attention to and be aware of for those first few weeks at home. I can't say it enough. It's just the interpretation of the crying. That's how they communicate. They will have a hunger cry, they will have a wet cry, they will have an anger cry, they will have a give me attention cry. You just need to be figuring out what they're asking for. And then how do you quiet them down? Remember those five S's? So you want to talk to your parents about shushing the baby, you know, the swinging, the swaddling. Swaddling is a big thing. Show your parents how to swaddle the baby so that they can do that at home because I'd be willing to bet every set of parents has one of those blue and white blankets in the hospital. Somehow or another one wound up in the bag that the parents took home. So show them how to swaddle their baby, how to quiet that baby down. You know, um, stimulation, you got to be careful about that. Remember that... Um, quiet alert stage, optimal stage for the baby, but if you overstimulate, then they may start pulling away from you. So you, you know, want to keep them engaged, but you don't want to overdo. Babies are supposed to be placed on their back for safe sleeping, but being on your back all the time, you're not going to develop your um, stomach muscles, your neck muscles. So you can actually put the baby down and let it have tummy time to um, help balance the core muscles and the neck muscles, but you need to always be with them, okay? So you never leave a baby unattended on their stomach. 
you know, watch for those developmental milestones, and you probably learned about those in peds, but, you know, when is the baby starting to be awake longer? When do they learn that they have hands and feet? When do they start trying to roll over? Um, those early kinds of things you want to talk to them about. And above all, how do you recognize signs of illness? You know, what's fever in our newborn? Are they eating and drinking enough? You know, is this listlessness? Is this an abnormality in their skin or one of the normal newborn rashes? They should, have, their pediatrician, there's always going to be somebody available. The office is always going to be available. Parents need to know that it's okay to call and ask. Okay, instead of saying, well, the office doesn't open until 8 o'clock tomorrow, they need to understand if they recognize a sign of a potential illness, they need to go ahead and talk to somebody about it. So that takes care of um, our assessment of our newborn, and um, we're going to be talking about newborn feeding in Chapter 18. Thanks.